Welcome to this, the second in a series of webinars hosted by NUS Consulting Group, in which we discuss key issues that are currently affecting both the global energy and the uh, wider commodity markets. Um, I think today's event is particularly timely, uh, given that we are in the middle of um, Climate Week, the Global International Climate Summit that's currently being held in New York. And uh, today's event, the impact of carbon on UK and European power prices, along with the follow-up of what we as NUS think the future of the European emissions trading system may well look like in a post-COVID and a post-Brexit environment. My name is Ron McDermott and I head up our markets trading and risk team which is based in NUS's UK office just outside of London. Um, we're responsible for managing risk, exposure and procurement on behalf of many of our major clients and I'll be your moderator today throughout this webinar. I have with me here Matt Gibson. Matt is our senior analyst in the markets team. Matt has an honours degree in physics, an MSc in sustainable energy futures, and he's currently pursuing his doctorate where he's looking at modeling synergies and the trade-offs of UN sustainable goals, which includes climate change, and energy amongst other areas. Matt has been with the company for the last five years and he has responsibility for all technical development within the markets trading and risk arena and he has a specific remit around renewables, carbon and the ongoing developments in these areas. Welcome Matt. Thanks Ron, good to be here. Um, just one very uh, sort of quick um, housekeeping aspect Today's format will be very much along the lines of our initial webinar with around 30 minutes of presentation, followed by 10, 15 minutes of questions at the end. Um, I believe you can send in questions uh, during the webinar and we will obviously endeavour to answer as many of these questions as possible in the time available. Um, for any questions that we can't answer or get to in the time available, um, I can assure you that we will get to them and we will reply to them separately once the webinar is finished. So Matt, um, without any further ado, I think um, at this stage, um, what might be helpful, um, perhaps as an initial jumping off point, um, would be if you could give us perhaps just a brief overview or an explanation around the European Emissions Trading Scheme um, something around carbon allowances, and perhaps highlight some of the key milestones along the way. Sure. Um, so as a bit of an initial background, the EU's emission trading scheme um, is essentially the central pillar of its energy and climate policy. Um, its goal is to drive down emissions by generating a carbon price that motiv motivates moves towards lower carbon activity. Um, it functions as a cap and trade system. And that's essentially where the total amount of emissions set by the EU and then installations that are uh, operate and are covered within the scheme have to possess a number of allowances equal to their annual emissions. Um, so just to dive in a little bit more, some of these um, allowances are allocated freely and the rest have to be purchased uh, via auction or traded on secondary markets. Um, for example, industrial installations, say for example cement plants, have a proportion of their emissions that are allocated freely. Um, and these are usually areas where there's a risk of so-called carbon leakage where these companies and businesses may go outside of Europe in order to operate. Um, importantly for us, um, power generators, so uh, we're talking coal and gas plants mostly, uh, these have to purchase their full 
um, equivalent emissions, there are no free allocations for these emitters. And so very, very briefly, why is this important? Um, well, essentially because the price of carbon directly influences the price that electricity consumers pay. Um, and this is because fossil fuel plants, and again, we're talking mainly coal and gas, becomes more costly to, to generate power. And then depending on the makeup of the grid mix in any particular market, this feeds through into wholesale prices. So Matt, um, since the uh, start of emissions trading scheme, um, how has the, um, if you like, the price of carbon, how has that evolved um, over the years since the carbon permits were actually introduced, um, particularly um, over what we've seen, um, say, in the last five years or so? Sure. So just going back a little bit further, um, essentially from 2011 up to 2017, um, prices were fairly low, trading around the, the 5 to 10 euro mark. Uh, the reason for these low prices is because there were far more allowances in circulation than actual demand. Um, the financial collapse of 2008 and the Great Recession that followed this, uh, coupled with faster than expected decarbonization of uh, electricity grids, meant that emissions were far lower uh, than the cap that the EU had set. And at that point, there was no flexibility in the system to address this. And so in 2017, what we saw from the EU was this proposal called the Market Stability Reserve. Um, and this was agreed towards the end of 2017 and came into force uh, at the start of last year. And basically, it is a mechanism to address this historic oversupply in uh, allowances, and it aims to rebalance the market by removing a uh, percentage of surplus allowances each year over a threshold. Um, and in theory, tightening the market should lead to stronger price signals. And that is indeed what we have seen. Um, as you can see, some of this rise has been fundamental demand from the uh, sectors covered that we mentioned earlier. So this is utilities and some industrial sectors. But also, some of this is financial speculation from banks and hedge funds uh, who, who see short to medium term opportunity here. Okay, Matt. So, um, in terms of this, this uh, supply demand uh, aspect of EUAs um, and, and volumes um, around carbon permits, um, what's the current supply demand situation, um, particularly as we look at? Uh, 2020 and, and beyond. Um, what can we expect uh, in terms of volumes going forward? Sure, so let's just keep this uh, very, very high level um, and hopefully this visualization will help, help inform you. Basically, if there's more supply than demand, um, this, this sends a price signal uh, for prices to decline. If there's more demand than supply, in theory, uh, this, this is supportive of increased prices. And so what we can see here is that there is, from the past uh, seven or eight years, that's phase three of the emissions trading scheme, there is this historic buildup of uh, allowances greater than the actual demand. Um, and so the surplus of this is currently 1.4 billion allowances. And if you look at the gray bar here, this is the number of allowances, which is approximately a billion, that the market stability reserve is taken out of the market and placed into reserve. Um, and so we're still operating at a surplus, um, and the forecasts are roughly by 2024 that, that the market will tighten. Okay, Matt, there was just uh, something I noticed um, back here on, on this earlier slide. Um, there's obviously been a lot of uh, volatility around carbon, uh, particularly as we look at 2020. Um, since the start of the year, we've seen it at a low of around about 15 euros a ton. And then it's pretty much doubled, if you like, in price up to around 30 euros a ton. Um, perhaps you could um, just give us a bit more insight um, as to what's um, what's behind these price swings that we've seen certainly since the start of, of, of this year? 
Yes. So uh, the COVID-related price shock was bracketed by two events. Um, the first, on March the 11th of this year, was where the uh, World Health Organization escalated the global severity of the virus from an outbreak to a pandemic. Um, and then approximately uh, a week of very rapid decline followed this announcement. Um, and as participants sort of flooded the market to, to sell their positions, before prices stabilized um, around the time that the European Central Bank announced its stimulus package. Um, and so the question is, um, with reports of weak demand um, and a net reduction in, in emissions, this year and perhaps into, into next year, um, why has the price rebounded so strongly um, and indeed not shown on this graph um, actually hit new highs last week? So I'm, I'm just um, looking at that, uh, that chart here just, just for a second, Matt, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what we're seeing um, particularly in this period from uh, if you like, mid-June up to, to where we are just now. And it looks as though um, carbon is quite strongly supported at the 25 euros a tonne level. And there does appear to be um, resistance price-wise around about the 30 euros level. And it's been range trading in this five euro area. Um, certainly, as we said, for the last three months. Now, um, from memory, I think the last time that we saw carbon uh, trading at these levels in this sort of 25 to 30 euro band was pretty much the same time as we saw last year, between June and September last year. But clearly, the economic backdrop between what we had last year and what we have this year are entirely different. So I think my question is probably along these lines. Um, do you think that carbon is overvalued at these levels? Um, whether or not the price is being artificially supported, and, and if so, is carbon likely to be in line, or the carbon price more, more importantly, likely to be in line for, uh, for a um, correction. Sort of three aspects to that um, yeah, question, Matt. What do you think is behind this? Um, what factors might be at play here, do you think, that might be keeping pricing at, uh, at these levels? Um, so, well, there are a number of competing price factors at play. Um, and I, I, should, I should mention before we just dive into these that Although there were highs of uh, above 30 euros last week, we're actually um, trading around 26 or 27 euros a ton at the moment. So there has indeed been some kind of correction and hopefully we'll be able to touch on that a bit more later on in the webinar, but focusing on these particular price factors. So we've mentioned some of the bearish drivers and we, we give these at the bottom here, you know, essentially, um, emissions impacted by lower demand is essentially the bearish driver here. Um, but let's just talk about some of the bullish drivers that, that may be supporting prices. Um, the first of which is compliance. Um, so this is a more of a procedural or operational driver that takes on some extra significance this year. And the reason is there are changes to the allowance requirements for 2021 onwards. And this means that companies that would have borrowed some of their free allocation in January and February of next year to go towards their previous year's balance can no longer do so anymore. Um, there, this is also against the broader backdrop that free allocation of allowances um, is a policy that the EU is trying to kind of cut out and it's very much in keeping with the EU strategy um, to sort of shrink the number of free, free allowances out there and the target is 0% by 2026. Therefore, there is a greater demand to buy permits at the moment in the past couple of months for the April 21 compliance deadline. 
the second driver is this uh, market stability reserve that we've mentioned previously. And uh, recently um, it was announced that over the next 12 months, over 300 million allowances will be taken out of circulation and put into reserve. The final and arguably most important driver is the EU Green Deal. Um, and so you'll no doubt have heard of this over the past few months, um, and it's essentially an overarching set of proposals from the EU Commission to make Europe net neutral from a carbon emission standpoint by 2050. Um, because of its importance, we will briefly just highlight some of the key points here. Um, and so the Green Deal is the flagship initiative um, of the EU Commission and its president, Ursula von der Leyen. Um, proposals over the past 12 months or so have looked to commit the EU to net zero emissions by 2050, along with a host of measures to help achieve this. Um, last week, the Commission formally announced a key piece of this, which is to increase the carbon reduction targets from 40% by 2030 based on 2005 levels to 55%. Um, this proposal and others will now pass to MEPs in the EU Parliament to debate and vote. Um, it's worth pointing out that the first reading of this vote is scheduled for the 2nd and 3rd of October, and after it has passed through Parliament, in whatever form that might be, negotiations will then proceed with the Member States of the EU Council. Um, and Again, it's worth just highlighting a key date to look out for is uh, June of next year, where the Commission will publish details of its policy reforms in order to achieve the targets by 2030 and 2050, among which the ETS is very much will take uh, centre stage of that, if you will. Okay, so, so um, maybe Matt, if, if I was just to try and synthesize um, these elements that you've been discussing uh, and if we bring all of these elements together um, the green deal that you've just uh, discussed the market stability reserve um, the eua surplus um, if we were to look at those if you like in the round what's the overall effect likely to be what impact do you think that those elements are likely to have on carbon pricing going forward? Um, well, in one word, bullish. Um, but I should probably just add it, it does depend on the exact nature of the targets that get passed. So um, let's just touch on that for, for one second before. So if we look at the likelihood of some of these um, measures and policies going, going through the EU and actually being written in, into law. Um, the Commission's position is 55% um, carbon targets by 2030. The, um, and not to get too kind of technical and niche about the EU here, but the EU's Parliament's environment and environmental committee actually committed to a 60% target. Um, and so there is a, a divergence of position there and also within the member states there are differing views on the extent of um, emissions cuts and who should share the burden of that. For example, Poland is quite strident in its views um, on perhaps weaker ambitions for climate policy and that's really because uh, they've got a very high share of coal which is sort of the most polluting um, of the main thermal fossil fuel ge generation plants. But let's just assume um, that some kind of targets are going to go through and, I've, and I feel my view is that, that these will, will be signed into law sooner rather than later. If it is, then the overall uh, message for, um, for us is, is essentially bullish for carbon pricing. Um, and so let's just have a quick look at some of the underlying reasons for that. And, and we won't go through all of these, we'll just kind of touch on a couple of more salient ones. Um, at present, around 45% of EU emissions are covered by the scheme. And as we've talked about, this mostly stems from power and industry with a little bit of aviation in there as well. Um, the proposed deal 
extends the scope of the scheme to other sectors, uh, including transport, heating, and shipping, which will lead to a number, a larger number of participants and a more liquid market. Indeed, last week, MEPs voted to include maritime shipping, which is responsible for approximately 14% of the EU emissions into the emissions trading scheme from 2022. Uh, and briefly, a very uh, significant measure is a possible one-off supply cut to the total number of allowances. And this is to sort of fundamentally realign um, the, the cap closer to actual observed demand. And there's little information on this at the moment, but what I'm seeing is that this could, could be expected in 2026, which seems like a long way away, um, but is actually uh, sooner rather than later when it comes to emissions trading schemes. Okay, so, so Matt, again, um, bullish for prices. Maybe if we can try and get to, to um, perhaps enough of, of some of this and see how this translates into, into prices. Um, if you were to try and project forward, Matt, um, could you get us some idea of what sort of range, perhaps, of carbon prices that we might see, um, perhaps, over the next five to five to ten years? So uh, this is a plot um, from the output of some work we've been doing to assess and synthesise sort of the breadth and direction of forecasts for EU carbon pricing over the course of the next five or 10 years. Um, and as you can see, the general trend is to increase over time um, from approximately 20 to 25 at the moment um, towards the 30 mark in 2030. Uh, and the shaded band here represents the variation in, in forecasts for a given day. Okay, I, I, I think just, <laughs> just looking at that, Matt, um, okay, you know, you've been seeing probably bullish, which we can see at that sort of near end, um, but I'm, I'm struck by the fact that sort of 22, 23, um, we see that sort of almost like that mean price reversal almost from, from 23 onwards. Um, what's, the, what's, the, what's behind that? Um, yes, yeah, so um, the reason for that slight dip, if you will, um, is as, the, as, as it stands, the market stability reserve, um, which if you remember is responsible for taking out this surplus number of uh, permits, um, the rate at which it does that at the moment is 24% of the surplus. Uh, and, but that's due to halve to 12% from 2023. And so the reason for this sort of reversion of price is because the rate at which the market is tightening will actually slow down um, from 2023 onwards under, I must have the current regime of the market stability reserve. I think we can expect these, the reforms announced in June to, to alter this slightly. Okay, um, and, and, and again, um, just looking at these projections, Matt, um, I think you mentioned earlier um, climate change agreement, the Paris Agreement, um, achieving net zero emissions by 20, 2050. Um, how far are these projections, or, or perhaps more importantly, are, are these projections consistent with uh, achieving, if you like, a, a, a net zero forecast by, say, 2050? 20, um, consistent with net zero, the short answer is no. Um, so in, in, in order for, for a net zero 2050 reality to take place, generally speaking, carbon prices need to be higher than they are now. And so this is just an extra little bit of work that we did and the pink shaded region is the range given by a group of leading economists that kind of look at climate finance and uh, carbon pricing. Um, and this, this range is essentially what would need to occur in order for the world to be on a path to deliver on the Paris Agreement. Um, and I should add that, that these figures are also in keeping with the EU's Commission's own assessment of the carbon price needed for net zero. Um, and over, over the longer term, i.e. From, from 2030 to 2050, we may well see, given uh, difficult to decarbonize sectors, a carbon price sort of well over 100 euros a tonne. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, that's interesting, Matt, just looking at that, obviously, um, based on those net zero projections, you, you could be talking 70 euros uh, a ton um, from 2030 onwards, which is an interesting, interesting thought on that upper, upper range. Um, but, but certainly, as we've said, um, bullish in the near term as far as uh, carbon pricing is concerned, uh, clearly uh, a lot of uh, uncertainty the further out that we go. But um, in, in terms of feeding this in, into um, electricity and, and power prices, um, how might this sort of scenario filter through into the wider power generation mix? And perhaps in particular, you know, how would that be likely to be reflected on power prices themselves? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, so to try and understand the impact of carbon prices in the future, uh, we wanted to, to try and derive some insight on its historical significance on power prices. Um, and so the plot here is some initial findings from some ongoing research that I'm doing to try and unpick and evaluate the role of carbon in power prices. Um, I, won't, I won't go into the details on, on the method here, but essentially we use some fairly advanced analytical tools and we looked at the influence of a number of commodity and wider energy drivers on the price of, of wholesale power for a number of European markets. And the main takeaway here is that from this preliminary analysis, uh, carbon, which is represented by the purple bar, was the largest factor for many markets over this time period study. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at that, Matt, I'm, I'm struck by the fact probably of, of, of uh, two things here. Um, Germany, Netherlands and, and, and Belgium, obviously carbon has a fairly significant um, relevance here. Um, but in fact, what I find quite surprising is, is when I look at the UK and the um, Nordic countries, and also Spain for that matter, it doesn't appear as though carbon is quite so significant. Um, can you give us just a, a just a brief insight as to why that why that might be? Uh, yeah, at first glance, it is a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? Um, but if we if we think around some of the reasons why, then there are a couple of things. So uh, the UK has another element to its to its carbon pricing, um, and this is the carbon price support. And this was introduced back in 2013 when uh, European carbon prices were very, very low. And this was in order to support a carbon price floor that the UK government had set. Um, and so the effective price for UK participants for much of the past 10 years has essentially been set by this carbon price support, which incidentally is now approximately £18 a tonne. Um, and, the, uh, and the effective uh, carbon price has meant that the EU emissions trading scheme carbon price has had very little impact on the UK power prices, um, apart from in recent, in sort of the recent last 24 months or so, when carbon pricing has been above this uh, 18 pounds per tonne rate. So I think that's partially the reason for the UK. Um, the Nordics, um, and Spain, I think, are more to do with the energy mix in these markets. Um, and so, uh, just to take Norway as an example, um, it generates nearly all of its electricity via hydroelectric power, and we're talking well over 90%, and it's indeed a net exporter. Um, uh, Spain, um, again, has a very high penetration of, of renewables, at the moment, it's about 40%, and it has been 35 to 40% for the past five years or so. Um, so I think those, those could, could be the reasons why we see a lower impact on, uh, for these markets. Okay. So, uh, again, just, just looking at that, that's obviously the, the, if you like, historical analysis that you've been working on, Matt, which is, is a particularly interesting. But, again, I think from, from everyone's perspective here, um, you know, if we were to try and project forward, what, what sort of impact do we do we think that um, uh, you know this is going to have on on power prices going forward? Yeah, so this this is the golden question, isn't it? Um, the central message is that over the next few years, a higher carbon price will mean higher wholesale prices. Um, however, 
Although, although this holds in general, there are of course some specifics to consider. Um, prime around these are the energy mix. So for example, we briefly talked about this, but Poland um, has approximately 80% of its, of its coal uh, is, is based on its power output. Um, and so it's obviously very, very impacted by the price of carbon. Compare this to somewhere like France, which has approximately three quarters of its, of its power output due to nuclear, and it obviously has less of an, of an impact. And one thing uh, just to talk about is uh, coal to gas switching. Um, and this refers to the displacement of coal power generation by gas-fired plants. Um, and so they both produce CO2 when burnt, we have to make that clear. However, gas emits roughly half as much as coal. Um, and there's a spectrum of prices around sort of 25 euros right up to 50 euros, whereby generation will switch from coal to gas. Um, analysis suggests that the EU has approximately 130 million tons of coal to gas switching potential. Um, however, the, the deficit that we need to, to drive is, is of the order of billions. And so um, given that that will only account for some of the decarbonization of Europe, clearly prices will need to be much higher than this in order to drive further reductions. Okay, Matt, there was just, I think it's just a question that, that somebody has just um, sent in, um, just uh, I think was questioning why uh, I think France wasn't included in here. Um, what I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, this is obviously just some initial work uh, that you've been working on um, as far as uh, the uh, historical data is concerned. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. No, um, so this, this was kind of the first cut of markets that we, that we chose to look at. Um, the the one, one reason why we initially opted not to include France, um, it's from our, from our experience, the French market maybe is less liberalized than some of the other markets um, in terms of uh, forward, forward trading of contracts and that sort of thing. So we wanted to kind of focus on some of the more liberalized markets to, to, to start with. But yes, yeah, certainly I, I, would, I would be interested to kind of see how, how France does feature in this analysis. Okay, so um, Matt, just going, going back to here, obviously, uh, clearly from, from what you've said, um, higher carbon feeding into higher wholesale, which, which, which uh, obviously makes sense, subject to those, those criteria, as you say, in terms of the actual context um, from country to country. Um, I think a lot of what's going to happen as far as pricing uh, is concerned going forward clearly is, is also going to be dependent on the, um, as you've mentioned previously, political will, um, the direction of the European Commission, the EU Parliament and the Member States, um, and, and certainly the recent legislation that we have seen um, suggests that this is likely to continue to be a moving feast. Um, but Obviously, from a, a, a UK perspective in particular, um, we've got the added complexity of Brexit um, at year end um, with the prospect of either a negotiated trade deal or perhaps the cliff edge scenario. Um, nonetheless, it's going to be a, upon us shortly. Um, and I just wonder again, if you can briefly perhaps shed some light on, on where we are. And again, from a carbon perspective, um, what we might well expect um, for carbon um, within the UK under, under that sort of scenario. Okay, um, so there are sort of officially, I guess, four options, but we can probably count off one straight away, um, and that's in the bottom right, um, an extension to, to uh, the transition period, which would essentially maintain the current arrangements um, Politically, um, that's a non-starter, it, se it seems like. So now we're down to three. Um, and I, will, I, will, I will be brief, um, and we'll just go through some of the remaining options of what might happen. Um, and so top left, a linked UK emissions trading scheme. And this is essentially as close to the status quo as possible. Um, and this, this has the, the advantage of addressing issues of competitiveness, and of course, uh, market liquidity. 
Now, a possible disadvantage is the lessening of sort of input onto the functioning of the scheme in its entirety. Um, um, if we shift across to the right, this, this will be a standalone ETS. Um, and now this would have the advantage of sort of policy autonomy and, and uh, more certainty over emissions that are being abated. However, there is a clear risk of low liquidity without other sectors being brought into the scheme. Um, and finally, a carbon tax. Um, so this gives greater price certainty because it can be set centrally and everyone pays a, a given price for the emissions that they um, sort of produce. And it's far simpler to administer than a trading scheme. However, it is a fairly blunt tool um, compared to a trading scheme. And the added dimension here is that you can never actually be sure of how many emissions have been abated. So the UK's government's stated preference is for a linked emissions trading scheme, which we feel would be the best outcome for both parties. However, uh, given the alarming timeline between now and the end of December, and there's, there is actually still an open government consultation on the carbon tax, and also the current state of negotiations, it appears unlikely that this will be put in place in time. And so our feeling is that it seems most likely that some kind of carbon tax bridge will be effective from January until a emissions trading scheme, linked or not, is up and running. Matt, uh, listen, that, that's, that's been, been particularly useful, uh, both in terms of the overview and, and insight, but um, and just looking at a time here, very conscious of where we are in terms of time. Um, and, and we have had a, a several uh, questions come in, um, some quite challenging as well. Um, and I've also got a few of, of my own. Um, and I would like to take advantage of just um, whatever time we have left, just to put um, some of these to you and to get um, your view, um, perhaps your insight and, and uh, your opinion. Um, and, and I think the, the first one I have here really, which I think is, is probably <laughs> really very pertinent. Um, you know, we're talking about a scenario here of bullish pricing. Um, from, a, from a business perspective, um, you know, how could you uh, look to mitigate the risk of a, some of these um, higher carbon prices in the future? What, what sort of um, suggestions would you have around that, um, if that's a scenario that we're likely to see? Uh, if a business is concerned about its exposure to, to carbon prices, and the follow-on impact that this may have on wholesale prices, there are a couple of things that it might consider. Um, firstly, I guess is flexible procurement. Um, and a lot of you may be familiar with this, but essentially it's whereby some of, of the expected future electricity consumption is purchased in advance. Um, and essentially this is a forward hedge to manage possible, possible volatility any upside price risk uh, in this case to do with uh, bullish carbon. Now, another emerging option um, are power purchase agreements, um, so-called PPAs and virtual PPAs. Um, and here, there is a bilateral agreement between buyer and seller, that is consumer and generator um, of electricity produced from a renewable source, typically wind or solar. And this is for a long-term long purchase. Um, we won't delve any deeper here, but if this is of interest, um, it is something that NUS can and does help with. Uh, and so they say, if you're interested, I would encourage you to get in touch with your consultant. Okay, so, so certainly as you say, um, short, medium term could be covered through um, flexible agreements. And if you're looking at long-term hedging to mitigate some of that um, uncertainty out into the future, then the possibility of PPAs might be a way of offsetting that, that sort of risk. Okay. Um, there's another one uh, that, uh, again, is quite pertinent. Um, we've obviously uh, seen this ongoing situation uh, with coronavirus. Um, how will a rise in coronavirus cases for the lockdown measures and, and uh, obviously increased economic strain impact um, on 
the price of carbon, Matt, which, which you, again, what's your view on, on that one? Um, well, I think it is, it's, it's clear now that several European countries are experiencing a second wave of the virus, um, you know, with in, in infection rates going up and some form of restrictions being reintroduced. And so if the situation worsens, then absolutely a degree of carbon price uh, softening or decline is possible. And indeed, in this past week, carbon has, has come off its 30 euro highs and now trading, as you mentioned before, around about 26 or 27 euros a ton. Now, just, just on that, this is probably a combination of profit taking actually, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, concerns on COVID related fundamentals. However, in any case, I don't believe it will fall to the levels we saw in March. And this is for two reasons. One, um, at the moment, national lockdown measures and the impact on demand that this has seems to be, let's just say, less politically palatable. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, carbon markets and its uh, effective pricing now has a very strong fundamental driver to try and ingest, um, and that is the Green Deal. Um, and now this, this was, of course, in discussion six months ago at the start of many of the European mm -hmm. lockdowns. However, developments both recent the past, in the past couple of weeks and going forward in the next few months should give confidence in the ETS and the price of carbon. Okay. Um, uh, I have another one, another one here, Matt. Um, UK carbon pricing, uh, just bear with me, UK carbon pricing uh, was set to be at least as ambitious as the EU ETS. Considering this as well as the recent recommendation by the EU Environmental Committee to increase the 2030 emission reduction targets to 55-60%, um, how will the UK government adapt with the higher emission reduction target if voted through by EU Parliament. Now, I know that's quite a long one, but if you could perhaps <laughs> uh, try and, and address that one as, as, as briefly as you can. Um, okay, I mean, I'm not a government insider. I'm not entirely sure that there is a concrete plan at present. However, uh, I can certainly talk about some of the things that have been published. So notionally, this was somewhat met by the UK's cap in its own emission scheme being set 5% lower than it would have otherwise been if it stayed in the uh, European equivalent. Um, however, whatever the outcome here, uh, this, this means that, that the proposed UK cap um, for 2021 onwards is actually still higher mm -hmm. than its um, projected and expected emissions. And that's both um, uh, as a result of COVID, but also kind of the historical emissions of the UK. Um, and it actually works out a fairly significant gap. And so just, just to make that clear, the UK currently in, it, in its own emissions trading scheme would have no similar supply side mechanism that the, the, U, the EU has introduced, and that is the MSR. Um, so, and not to get too, too technical here, however, <laughs> with a cap higher than the actual emissions, Therefore, supply is higher than demand. Once again, this, this motivates bearish price pressure if this comes to fruition. Um, and so this is a key point here. Uh, prices will tend towards the minimum price floor that the UK government is floating, which is approximately £15 per ton. And so you're actually then at the kind of mercy of uh, kind of non-physical non participants that may wish to, to, to speculate on UK carbon pricing, um, and that will always necessitate a some degree of price volatility. Okay, and, and, and if we see then, then say a carbon tax rather than cap and trade, um, uh, what level of tax could we expect to see, Matt? Um, so we, there's a little bit more clarity on this. Um, so if a carbon tax was put in place January of next year, the 2021 rate would be tied to the average price of the, um, of the equivalent EU carbon price for that year, which would be the EU's December 2021 traded futures price. 
So it's very much linked to the average price of that contract. However, it's not clear if this is over the whole trading period or in the preceding 12 months. Um, hopefully, greater clarity on this will, will be expected uh, during the autumn budget of this year, which we don't have a date yet um, because the Chancellor, I think, is busy doing other things, but probably October or November of this year, we should get some more clarity on the actual rate of carbon tax. Okay. Um, Matt, again, uh, I'm just conscious of, of time here, but um, th there are a few questions. There's one other here, I think, that, that's slightly, uh, slightly different from, from uh, some of the others that we've had. But um, if coal generation became uneconomical for a power generator due to carbon market reforms, how would it diversify away and continue to supply enough electricity to maintain financial viability? Um, that sounds fairly complex, but I, I wonder, again, if you could try and be as succinct uh, around that one and just give us, again, your, your view on, on, on that, please. Okay, yeah, I, I will be brief because I appreciate that we're about on time at the moment. Um, so, okay, um, there are a couple of things that we can briefly talk about. Number one, I think the only way coal remains competitive in this sort of high carbon price future is if it is accompanied by some form of carbon capture and storage. Uh, that will mean some things to some of you and others will not have heard of it, but that's essentially the emissions from, from a coal plant get, get captured by a number of sort of tech, technology solutions and they get stored um, for a large number of years. However, the economics of this are very costly. And so you'd be talking, you know, 80, 90, 100 euros per ton for this to make sense of scale. And also, crucially, actually, many European countries have either legally committed or have a target to eliminate coal generation within the decade. So, in my view, Europe and coal um, is a relationship that is dying fast. Okay. Um, <laughs> Matt, uh, it, it's amazing how quickly um, time uh, flies when, when uh, the topic is as interesting as this is. But, um, clearly, the, the, there are a, a lot of uh, questions that have come in uh, that we, we, we do want to address. Um, but, but I think, given the time, um, I, th I think it's appropriate to, to finish at, at this stage. Um, and, and Matt, um, can I thank you, uh, you know, again for your input and your participation? I think it's, it's uh, been very insightful and, again, much, uh, much appreciated for that. Um, I hope um, everyone who has uh, joined this web webinar, I hope um, you have found it, today's discussion, um, both uh, useful and informative. Uh, we will be making it available um, in recorded format. And uh, I also hope um, that you will uh, be joining NUS Consulting Group on our next webinar. Uh, the details of which we will be publishing shortly and which you will be able to uh, join and participate in again via LinkedIn. So can I just again thank you for your participation and uh, again many thanks for, for listening to us.